Eagles Entertainment. The journey of the draft is driven by AAA. AAA roadside is their strong side. Make AAA a part of your game day today. AAA, go ahead. With the 21st pick in the NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and we have got a fun episode because the NFL Draft, just over 24 hours away. We've got the draft one day away from where we are right now. Cannot wait for the start of this 2020 event. But we're going to get things started here with our final preview. We're going to be joined once again by NFL Film senior producer Greg Cosell. He joined us yesterday on the show to talk about the top offensive players. Today, we're talking about the top defensive players. Let's get started. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's preview. We've got one final one here. Let's talk defense. It's time for Mr. Relevant. It's time for Mr. Relevant. All right, well, let's get things started here, guys. Again, we're going to welcome in NFL Film Senior Producer Greg Cosell. Greg, uh, welcome back to the show. We're going to talk defense today, and we're going to start at the very top because I feel most people would say that the top defensive player in this draft is defensive end Chase Young from Ohio State. And I'd like to just ask you this. We know that Chase Young is ridiculously talented. The question that everybody asks is, how does he compare to Joey Bosa and Nick <laughs> his two predecessors that came before him at Ohio State. How do you feel that those guys compare? Because the Eagles very likely to see Chase Young twice a year now once he gets drafted by Washington second overall tomorrow. I think Young is more explosively athletic than either Bosa, and I don't think he uses his hands quite as well. Although I will say that at Ohio State, they must do a really good job teaching defensive linemen how to use their hands because they're all pretty good. Young's not bad at it. I think he just needs to get a little better. But he's he has elite athletic traits, explosive lateral agility and quickness, change of direction, flexibility and bend, closing speed. I mean, it, I don't think he's a hard evaluation from the standpoint of his athletic traits. Yeah, Greg, I want to go through a couple of these boom or bust prospects, which seems like uh... – the edge rusher group has a lot of them for different reasons, whether it's, you know, undersized positional fit like a Zach Bond or a Josh Yuchi. But I'm really intrigued with Terrell Lewis at the University of Alabama. Two serious injuries, ACL and elbow injury, only 680 snaps on the field in his career. But when he's on the field, he has a really unique mix of a powerful upper half and a loose, flexible lower half. Just the injury concern, the experience. There's a lot of guys in this edge group that seem to be a boomer bust. Have you watched Lewis? Yeah, I have been. I think he'll be polarizing. He's very high cut and long limb. He's got that short torso and long legs. And for some, that will indicate that there's a limitation in his bend and flexibility and his change of direction. There were times that showed up. Other times it didn't. He showed a pretty nasty spin move, which was really effective. Um, I think he's a good athlete. I think he showed pass rush traits. Um, I think he probably needs to develop more of a consistent speed to power game, but there were snaps in which he did show that. So I think when you look at him, you see traits. You, from a size, length, athleticism standpoint, so you see traits and you feel like he could develop into an effective sub-front pass rusher. So speaking of these second-tier pass rushers and guys who have traits, Julian Okwara from Notre Dame, Greg, is someone who comes to mind for me where he looks the part and he has traits that I think are going to get that will get him pushed up the boards. But from your film evaluation, where is he underdeveloped that teams must recognize as he makes the initial transition to the NFL? I, I mean, if you're looking at some flaws in his game, I think he has a tendency to play too high and upright, and that really negatively impacted his ability to play the run. Um, I think as an on the ball player at the NFL level, he needs to uh, get stronger. Uh, he has limited functional strength. I think overall, there's not a ton of physicality to his play. Um, you know, I, I don't think he's a great change of direction athlete. Now, he, as you said, C. Mac, he looks the part because he's got that long, athletic, rangy build, and he's got burst and flexibility to clear the edge and corner and flatten to the quarterback. So he has that trait, and that's that's what people look for in a pass rusher. Now, Greg, I'm going to kind of go on the other end of the spectrum here with Curtis Weaver from Boise State, someone who is very ultra-productive, Mountain West Defensive Player of the Year. Some publications have him as a first-team All-American selection. But sort of like A.J. Epinesa of Iowa, the physical traits don't quite match the production. When it comes to Curtis Weaver specifically, 
what does he do that teams will say that can translate successfully to playing on Sundays in the NFL? I mean, I think there are some subtleties and nuances to his game as a pass rusher. Can he build on those? Can he become a high-level technician? The issue with, with me, uh, with him, uh, was he's a bad body athlete. And when I look at those guys and watch them on tape, and, and again, maybe it's just me, but sometimes I just struggle to get beyond that. You know, he does not – he looked like he carried too much weight. He looks soft and too heavy on film. He's not a great athlete by any means. So a player like that, um, you get into that same point about a guy that, you know, goes to a pretty major school, and if he's a bad body athlete after 40 years – do you feel like he's going to come into the NFL and all of a sudden become a lean and mean? Well, one guy I feel, you know, just watching him over the last couple of years, Greg, that, you know, has that, that edge, has that mean streak. I, I think when you look at Jabari Zaniga from Florida, uh, you know, this is a guy that's got some position versatility, uh, was banged up this year, obviously, and, you know, didn't spend a, a ton of time on the field, especially uh, in the second half of the year. But I think when you go back and you look at the big picture with Jabari Zaniga, I'm interested to get your take on him and how you feel he best transitions to the NFL. Fran, I thought he was one of the most fascinating defensive players I watched because he looks the part. He played multiple positions along Florida's defensive front and flashed both outside and inside as a pass rusher. And he showed outstanding flashes of explosive athleticism as a pass rusher. If you can tap into that and really make him, you know, into what his, his traits are, what's there in his traits, Boy, with that long limb body and sudden burst off the edge, I, I think he is one of those guys that has a chance. Like Okwara, you know, they both have that long, rangy body, and they really look the part. You get excited about those guys. It's like the Penn State kid too. He's, you know, they're they're long, they're rangy. There's a slippery feel to them. They can bend, and you know, you get excited about those kinds of traits. What I'm most excited about Zaniga, Greg, is just the fact he doesn't have to come off the field. Everybody no. was excited about Ja'Kai Polite last year. Ja'Kai Polite didn't play in base packages. He got That's a lot correct. of the sacks and obviously had the high side rushes. But Zaniga was a much better run defender, positionally versatile, sliding into three-tech. I just felt like it was a lot like Ryan Anderson and Tim Williams out of Alabama a couple years ago. Tim Williams was, was the exciting pass rusher, but Ryan Anderson was the better down-to-down -down football player. And I feel like similar with Zaniga, not the sexiest guy, even this year, Jonathan Grenard got a lot of the sacks off the edge, the Louisville transfer. But Zaniga is a great player that I don't think has to come off the field on Sundays. No, it's funny you say that because I made a point. He was lined up at wide nine defensive end. He lined up at five technique, four I, three technique. I mean, he, he played multiple positions along the defensive front, and more and more teams are moving in that direction with their fronts, particularly their sub fronts. Now, Greg, I want to stay in the SEC as we transition to the interior defensive lineman. And I want to start with sort of a, a philosophical discussion regarding Auburn's Derek Brown. It seems like he is someone who can stick in the league for a long time as a stout run defender. And that would be very good, but does he have the tools to project a role in where he can disrupt the passer? Because I feel like if he's going to be truly worth a top five pick, like most mock drafts have him going, or even if you say top seven, top eight selections, he needs to impact the pass game as well as the run game. And C-Mac, I think that's the point, and I made that point. I think the pass rush to mention – is critical because that will determine his ultimate value in the NFL. And you get into that debate about defensive tackles in today's NFL. Where do you draft them if you don't feel that they're big impactors as pass rushers? Brown's tape is very, very good. There's, there's a lot to like when you study him. Uh, he made a ton of plays for a man that size outside the box. He ran down people. Uh, I kind of viewed him as, and I had this conversation with a defensive coach at the Combine. He, he agreed with me. When I watched Brown, two players came to my mind, Michael Brockers and Akeem Hicks. I think they're both very good pros, but I'm not sure you'd consider either one a big-time inside pass rusher. Maybe Hicks a little more than Brockers. Um, so I think Brown needs to improve as a pass rusher, and whether he can, again, that's no one knows the answer to that, but, but there's a lot of good tape with Brown. And sticking with the interior lineman, I want to go to Neville Gallimore out of Oklahoma because he's someone – who showed that he can be a penetrating three technique or he can two-gap as well. He's playing both styles of defenses under different coordinators there. 
at Oklahoma. So for you, Greg, does that versatility make it more attractive to teams? Or do you think that there's a role that he's better suited for, whether he played one or the other much, much better on film? Well, I think he's got natural quickness. He's got athletic movement. He's very competitive. I think he did show the ability to rush the quarterback. Oklahoma was a big slanting team. I mean, he slanted a ton to get him into gaps. So the question is, can he just line up and play without doing all that slanting? Um, he's got a, He's shorter than you'd ideally like. He needs to play a quickness explosion game. He did have a tendency to to stand up at times off the snap of the ball, play too high. And he can't be that guy because he's just too small. He's, he's not powerful in that sense. So I think there's pros and cons to his game. I did not think he was the best interior pass rusher in his class, by the way. Who would well, that guy? be? I thought Ross Blacklock was the best interior pass rusher in this class based on tape. And, I, and maybe I'm in the minority, but I really, really like his tape. Yeah, that's I what mean, I was going to ask you about him. What, what, what stood out, I guess, you know, in terms of his ability to rush the passer? Because I believe, let me just go back. And obviously, look, numbers aren't numbers don't mean everything. But you know, just looking at the numbers over the last couple of years, uh, he was hurt two seasons ago. Um, you know, finished his career with five and a half sacks, but uh, certainly has that short area burst. Oh, and he played a ton of one technique and zero technique this year. And I think he can be a three technique in the NFL. I think his skill set fits being a three technique. I mean, he's got elite lateral quickness and change of direction. He has closing burst and speed. Uh, he lined up at times at defensive end and rushed the quarterback. Um, I, I think he's a high-level prospect due to his pass rush ability, and that's in demand in the NFL. So I thought of the interior defensive linemen, whether you're talking about Derek Brown, whether you're talking about Javon Kinlaw and Neville Gallimore, I thought Blacklock was the best interior pass rusher. One guy I feel just, you know, the, the ceiling is just so high with him is Jordan Elliott. I feel like he might have the highest ceiling of all these guys in the interior. Uh, I'm interested to see, you know, what your thoughts were on him. Uh, I, I was really, really impressed with his film. Yeah, I like him too. Um, you know, I, I probably feel after Blacklock, he would probably be next for me in terms of, of being able to rush the quarterback at the NFL level. So, and, and again, that gets into a philosophical discussion about the value of interior players in today's NFL and, and the value of pass rush. Because it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of people feel that if you're an interior defensive tackle and you cannot rush the quarterback, what, are, what is ultimately your value? Are you playing 25 or 30% of the snaps in today's NFL? And then you have to decide where you draft that particular player. And that's going to be the question facing Raekwon Davis. You know, this is a guy oh, yeah. I think over the last couple of years has had like a half a sack or one and a half yeah. sack. Um, you know, he burst onto the scene as a sophomore. He had, I think it was seven and a half or eight and a half sacks that year. And everybody had him as a top 10 pick. Um, you know, and I, I've always liked the film. I mean, he's a violent player. He's great against the run. And I do yeah. think there's some pass rush upside. He just hasn't been able to put it all together. No. And the question is, given his size, at, at, can he develop? And again, now you get into coaching. Can he develop into a DeForest Buckner kind of player? Now, I'm not saying he's, he's certainly not DeForest Buckner now, um, but given that kind of size and his build, he looks like that. So the question is, can if you, if you so-called turn him loose and use him that way, can he become that kind of player? Because you're right. I actually watched him after his sophomore year. I guess it was his sophomore year, right, Fran? It was, yep. He, I thought, watching that tape, because uh, I watched it that summer, so – uh, I thought, God, this guy could be a top 12, top 15 pick. And obviously it didn't play out that way with the rest of his career. Well, the, I think the next position that we would love to ask you about, uh, Greg, is, is the linebacker spot. And there's just so many guys. You know, I think this is a position that, honestly, I mean, when people are talking about who are, what are the deepest positions, people aren't necessarily talking about linebacker, but there are a ton of guys. And, Ben, I know one guy that you're, you're really high on and I'm really high on as well, and I've really grown <clears throat> more and more attached to throughout the process. Uh, ben, I know you wanted to talk about Kenneth Murray. Yeah, absolutely. I think the linebacker group is so interesting because you have some box safeties, you have some massive safeties that have come down and spent a lot of time near the line of scrimmage. And then the linebacker position, you have guys around 245, 250, like Kenneth Murray, Malik Harrison. You have some guys around 215. So it's really interesting. But Murray, one of the more impressive stacked linebackers that I think I've ever watched, Greg, sideline to sideline speed, obviously his playmaking ability. I'm not sure he's ever taken a step backwards 
words in his right. college career, much more of a sub rusher with some twists and blitzing ability. But do you think he's kind of a scheme versatile guy that can plug and play in any, uh, any middle of the defense in the NFL? Without question. I'm glad to hear you say that because he was far and away my favorite stack backer. And I finished my transition by saying that he's the best stack linebacker prospect in this draft class with the athleticism, physical traits, and attributes to fulfill all the responsibilities needed to play the position at a high level. And in addition, he was used as an edge rusher at times. In that way, he reminded me a little of Rashawn Evans, uh, but he's a bigger man. Um, I love the Maurice Tate. Now, granted, he played downhill a lot based on their scheme because they were a slant and scrape defense, but he came downhill with purpose. I really liked his game. Like, again, this is just from watching college tape, and you just try to think about transition, but I liked his tape far more than I like Patrick Queen's tape. Yeah, real quick, Greg, just kind of following up on this linebacker position, and everybody's follow-up in 2020 football is linebacker, Oh, can they cover? I just want to know what your philosophical approach is on linebackers' coverage ability when it's such a sub-package league and teams want to get into nickel and dime and feature their safeties and the defensive backs to cover the backs and the tight ends in this league. Are they really having linebackers cover that often in the NFL anymore? Yes and no. But, you know, I think we're getting into it's, – it's funny you ask me that. And we talked about this with the running backs when we did the offensive – uh, part of this it's as if the run game doesn't exist in the NFL anymore and, and you can't quite go that far you know people make these platitudinous statements you know oh you need a great quarterback the run game doesn't matter you know stacked linebackers don't matter you know they do until they don't matter until they do matter and then when you play teams that run the ball you know it's it's like Patrick Queen okay Patrick Queen can play sideline to sideline Patrick Queen did not play downhill very well at all he was not a physical player. And at some point, you have to be able to do that. And if you can't do it and you can't do it well, then you're going to have a problem with your defense. You have to talk to coaches and, and find out how they feel when they don't have players at particular positions that can do certain things and how that limits their options defensively. So you can't I, – I know exactly what you're saying, Ben, and I'm not saying you agree with this – but you can't just look at stacked linebackers and, and say, well, all they have to do is cover. No, that's not all they have to do. They're going to have to do other things as well. So, Greg, to follow up on Patrick Queen, he's a one-year starter. Do you think that in his year of development, did he show enough that he can project at some point to a three-down roll at, at the next level because you brought up uh, his prowess in the run game? Um. I think right now he's a sub-package player. I don't think at this point in time he's really a, a big run defender. I mean, I, I don't remember him making a lot of plays playing downhill. I really don't. Um, now, can he play sideline to sideline? He can play sideline to sideline. I think he's a little bit of a short strider. I, I don't know. I don't think – like I don't put Patrick Queen in the same category as, let's say, a Roquan Smith coming out of Georgia. I don't think he's that kind of player at all. So, you know, I think Queen is, is – he's one of those guys I would view as a good prospect. Now, I thought he improved as the year went on in terms of play recognition and reaction time and quickness, and that's going to need to be a part of his game so his athletic traits can show up. Because when he did trigger, he did show up that burst in closing speed. Um, and he does have range. But, you know, I didn't see him as an, oh, my God, wow, he's got it all right now. And, Greg, just to spin this to the other side of this linebacker equation, these undersized players like Hakeem Davis-Gaither at App State, who played most of the season at 215. He showed up to the combine at 224, put on a couple pounds. But he really wasn't in the box a whole lot at App State. No. Really what I no. call that halfway player, where you're a nickel Sam, you're kind of detached from the box, you're out in space, you're that last guy in the box. We've seen a lot of guys coming into college football, excuse me, out of college football, struggling with that transition, whether that's yes. Darren Lee at Ohio State or Terrell Hanks last year at New Mexico State. This Good position point. makes a lot of plays in college. What are some things you like and don't like from Akeem Davis-Gaither and kind of just that position in general? It's a great point, Ben, because a lot of these guys – you know, he did not play stack that much in college. Um, he, he, you know, I kind of call that the overhang position. I guess everybody has their term for it. You know, he, he's a highly twitched up athlete. He's got quickness. He's physical. He's competitive. Um, he certainly has the athleticism to be an excellent coverage player, matching up in both man and playing zone. Um, 
he's a sub defense kind of player right now. Um, but you're right. He's not really a stacked linebacker. Uh, and then he didn't do that. Um, he's so, but there's a lot more guys like that in the college game, particularly on the wide side of the field, which is so wide in college football. Greg, speaking of, of great athletes at the linebacker position in this draft class, Willie Gay Jr. really put his name on the map with the combine timing and testing workouts, but not a ton of on-field experience for a variety of reasons. If we're putting aside the, the off-field maturity issues because the teams have to sort that out, what did you see on film and how his game will translate to the next level? I mean, certainly he brings a strong traits profile. He has good size. He's explosive type sideline to sideline with that speed range. He can react. Um, I thought he made a couple of good plays or I thought he did a real nice job with understanding what he was seeing. Um, I think he'll get people excited with his size, athleticism profile. And then it comes down to more development. Um, he, he came to Mississippi State as a big time recruit, never quite became that great player. So now you have to figure out why, you know, what, is there something missing? You know, how can he can he handle everything that he needs to handle? But certainly the, the physical athletic traits will get linebacker coaches excited. And just to paint the full picture there, Greg, he played 177 snaps this year. He's only played a little over 800 in his career. Really That's one of the more boom, yeah. boom or bust prospects in this entire draft. And these guys – are polarizing and they're all over the boards. I see anywhere from a late one to a day three player in Willie Gay. Without question. So he becomes in the eye of the beholder. You know, now you get into coaching staffs. You know, does a coach look at him and say, hey, look at those traits. I'm going to make him into a great player. You know, that's what you get into. And then there's other teams that will say, God, the guy may have a lot of traits, but there's not a lot of production, didn't play a lot of snaps. I don't want him. You know, that's what you get into with these kinds of players. I feel like another guy who's kind of a beauty in the eye of the beholder is, is Zach Vaughn. You know, we've played off the edge as a undersized 3-4 outside backer. Some people feel like he's going to make the move inside to inside, but other people feel like, you know, he can, he can be a 3-4 outside backer and can c come off the edge as a pass rusher. I'm interested to get your thoughts uh, on Zach Vaughn and how he translates to the league. Yeah, he's really intriguing because he was predominantly, as you said, an on-the-ball linebacker in Wisconsin defense, and he was a really good pass rusher. Um, I thought he did a nice job as an underneath zone coverage defender. Uh, he showed clearly showed explosive traits as a pass rusher and a run defender. He played fast. He played with excellent recognition and reaction skills. You know, I watched him and I tried to think, okay, he's 238. Can he be an outside backer in a 3-4 or 238? Or do you have to move him inside? Or do you need kind of a creative, you know, defensive coach? I started to think more and more of a guy like Kyle Van Noy when I watched him, but I thought that Vaughn was a little more of an explosive athlete than Van Noy. One guy that really just kind of stayed, this will be the last linebacker I ask about, is that really just grew on me the more I watched was Logan Wilson from Wyoming. Um, you know, was incredibly yep. productive, uh, run game and pass game, but uh, was used in so many different ways. Well, let me ask you a question. Who do you like more, Logan Wilson or Patrick Queen? I feel like you, you, there's a little bit more upside there with, with Queen, but I think you're getting more of a maybe ready-made player in terms of being a three-down player with Logan Wilson. Yeah, I mean, I thought Wilson was kind of a fluid, instinctive three-down linebacker, rangy, sideline to sideline speed. I thought he was strong in coverage, both man and zone. He can match up to tight ends and backs. I thought he showed good zone awareness. You could say he's not his weakness might be a lack of physicality, but you'd say the same about Patrick Queen. Um, I like Wilson. The other guy I like, I liked Jordan Brooks. I thought he was an explosive downhill athlete. I mean, man, he played downhill, and he was physical. Um, now, I don't think that he's, he's a very good pass coverage player. You know, maybe he's one of those two-down guys. You don't draft very high because he plays 30% of your snaps. But uh, he was fun to watch for me. I thought he was explosive downhill. Yeah, I was a, a big fan of, of that kid, you know, watching him on film over in the fall and then actually just re-watched him uh, just to get a little bit more and get a final look at him. And, and he certainly uh, is one of the better three-down linebackers in this class. Uh, Greg, let's, let's transition to the cornerback spot. And, uh, you know, Jeff Fakuda obviously takes the headlines as the top cover guy, uh, but there are so many players. Ben, I, I'd like to get, go to you first. Is there a – you kind of want to start things off here with Greg? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody's looking for that kind of alpha dog man coverage corner that can play press and really race the team's number one receiver. I think Jeffrey Okuda obviously is the cream of the crop uh, at the cornerback position, but C.J. Henderson seems to be right on his heels and obviously has some, uh, some issues with his play personality and effort against the run. But what you're doing with this kid is drafting him to be an alpha press man corner. Uh, that I think has a lot of ability. I think is just as intriguing as Jeffrey Akuda. Reminded me and Fran a lot of Dominique Rogers Cromartie uh, coming out a couple years ago, which also had a little bit of a timid play profile, but great speed, and you know he's going to show up off the bus ready to cover and man coverage. I just think that has tremendous value on Sundays in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, I think his traits are similar to Akuda. I think Akuda's just a little better, but I think they're similar. I mean, Henderson has patience, footwork, balance, transition, change of direction. He's smooth. He's comfortable. He had the speed to run easily on vertical routes. He's a high-level corner prospect, Henderson. You know, and the thing is, he's big like Okuda. Um, and it's funny you talk about it. I, you know, maybe I missed something. I don't think he's timid. I just don't think he tackles with a whole lot of, you know, any kind of technique or, or, or fundamentals. But I don't think he's unwilling. Um, you know, he was used at times as a blitzer from the boundary corner position. You know, I'm not suggesting he's, you know, he's a super aggressive competitive guy, but I don't think he's timid. And absolutely, on those cat blitzes, you see he was not shy about going 100 miles an hour and no, helping some quarterbacks no. or even running backs in the backfield. So, you know, I just wonder when you look at some teams like New England and now the Brian Flores, Matt Patricia, they've always preached their number one trait they want in corners is the ability to tackle. We only get 11 out there. Everybody must be able to get the ball carrier on the ground. So when we look at some other guys like a Trayvon Diggs with some serious size and physicality, where do you think his skill set kind of matches up against some of the uh, C.J. Hendersons and Akutas of the draft? I love Trayvon Diggs. And, you know, in this league now, you have to be able to play man coverage. And, you know, you could have a healthy debate with the changing nature of NFL pass games about, you know, what's more important, an edge pass rusher or a corner. Because obviously when it's third and nine, got to rush the quarterback. But the NFL pass games now, again, he's got size, length, athleticism. He can run. He's physical. He's competitive now. Um, there were times, after, you know, thinking this through, and I know he's not as purely natural in man coverage or quite as smooth as Okuda or Henderson, but there were times I was thinking, God, this guy is right up there for me. I really love Trayvon Diggs as a corner prospect. Yeah, I do too, Greg. And he is absolutely massive for a corner. Not just tall and long, but a thick kind of core and barrel chest. I don't know if he reminds me of a Jimmy Smith or a Sean Smith, even Ron Bartell or Namdi Asamoa. But those big corners, I'm telling you, his size and play strength saves himself a lot at the line of scrimmage. No Re question. Receivers are going to have a lot of trouble getting off the line of scrimmage against a, a size corner like Trayvon no, Diggs. No, you know, uh, another player who's kind of has that kind of size, and I'm not saying he's exactly this player, but Patrick Peterson has that kind of size. Absolutely. That's all in the same ballpark of cover yeah. corner, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's why I feel like, you know, one of the things I love about Diggs was he had that competitive streak. And that's one of the things oh. I love about Jeff Gladney, too. I, Gladney's built in a much different package. But uh, you're talking about a guy that's just going to – he's going to fight you every single time you line up against him. Uh, Gladney really stood out to me with that trade. What, what do you feel about him? Uh, the, obviously, the TCU corner. What do you, what do you think about I, Gladney coming out? I really like Gladney. I'm sure you watched him against Mims. That was a nice matchup when they were head to head. Um, I like Jeff Gladney a lot. The big question with Gladney uh, is it, he played outside in college. Is, is he an outside corner in the NFL, or do you move him inside? Now, he's the same size, basically, as Tredavious White, so you can't say he's too small to play on the outside because Tredavious White plays corner on the outside pretty darn well in the league. But he certainly has the traits to move inside. I mean, his mental and physical toughness and high-level competitiveness kind of reminded me of Trayvon Diggs. He's just a smaller human being. Uh, he could play inside, I think, and be really, really good. But I really like Gladney's tape. The issue, again, is just going to be team-specific. How do you view a corner that's under 5'11 and weighs 190 pounds? You know, how do you see him within the context of what you do defensively with your corner position?
Yeah, I think that's a great point. I guess you got to look. Christian Fulton's built a little bit bigger than Gladney, uh, and you know I think he's not quite as competitive. But uh, I think you still see that quickness and the you know that ability to recover and make a play on the ball. Uh, what have you seen from Christian Fulton during your study? Funny, Fran, you mentioned the ability to recover because I think and I, and Ben, have you watched him by the way? Yes, I have. Yep, interesting right, player. Here, here's what I thought, and again, I thought that his. His college tape was littered throughout with balance and body control issues, false steps, balance issues. But yet in college, he recovered and made plays. That's funny so, you say that, Greg. Literally, my first note is he gets out of phase almost immediately, yes. but he's kind of comfortable in recovery mode. That's literally one of the first lines of my report is he's somehow comfortable in recovery mode, which so is a, we, kind of a weird trait in, its, in itself. That's, so my, go- that's my golf game. <laughs> <laughs> got to be able to scramble out there got to be able to scramble so we agree so the question i have is will that work in the nfl i mean I, you know and i can't answer that question you know and you know and obviously teams they haven't been able to spend time with him and put him through individual workouts but i mean he certainly has press man coverage traits but those flaws and inconsistencies to me need to be cleaned up because i you know i just don't know if if you have those issues you know and then you're matching them up to high-level NFL wideouts, is, is that going to work? I, I can't answer that. I just know that, obviously, Ben, you and I agree with what we saw on tape. And then what what does that mean, playing man coverage? I remember one play, that, and it was just one play, but it sticks out in my head, and that's the, the joy of watching full games is uh, against Alabama. The ball was actually thrown to Jerry Judy, but Henry Ruggs just made him look silly on a route, and he got all caught up, you know, he – he did just what you said. He got totally out of phase, literally on his first step, and Ruggs made him look silly on – and it wasn't a vertical route either. It was a, an intermediate route. And that happened too many times. So I just – I'm not certain. Yeah, those are things I know actually with offensive tackles. I like the ability to recover. Things are going to go wrong in pass protection. You might get your foot stepped on or take a bad step or, you know, get your hands knocked down. Can you recover out of a bad situation? But as I know – good recovery, good recovery, good recovery. Why are we always in recovery mode? And I think that's kind of the the full picture with that is it's great you can do it, but why are you always in that situation? And it's going to be that much harder to recover on Sundays. Correct. So I I was uncertain about him in my transition. Now, Greg, someone along the same lines who's very athletically gifted but raw is Noah Igbenogany from Auburn. That's easy for you to say. (laughs) Well, the thing is, he made the conversion from wide receiver to cornerback during his career. And you now have tape out of him playing corner for the past two years. I feel like there are times we see these types of corners who have the athletic tools that make teams drool, but they don't always fulfill at the next level because they don't have the technique. They, they lack those right. traits to be able to make that conversion. Did you see enough from Igbenogany in those two years to think that he can progress forward and be able to thrive on Sundays? I mean, I think he's pretty explosive as an athlete with good speed. He's really competitive. I I would imagine some people might see him moving inside. Um, I made the point that he's a work in progress, but he fits the athletic and competitive profile of an NFL corner. Uh, And I said he requires coaching and development. It might take some time, but there could be a big payoff. Um, But, you know, he's not a long athlete, which he could also, like I said, you could see him moving inside. Um, But on the other hand, it's not that easy to move inside because now you've got two-way goes by receivers. And obviously, he does not have a lot of corner experience. He made the switch from wide receiver. He was actually a pretty big-time wide receiver recruit coming out of the state of Alabama. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to like. I think he's a guy that probably needs coaching and, and a defined sense of a team of what they want to do with him. Staying along those same lines in terms of specific team player match, uh, a player I'm intrigued by is Cameron Dantzler from Mississippi State. We've talked a lot about him on on the podcast. He has the length and the athleticism, but do you think that he is scheme-specific? Because some of the things that he got away with at Mississippi State aren't going to quite work in the NFL. Yeah, he's he's tall. He's not heavy. I mean, I think he's he's weighed under 190. Um, But he's got that length that everybody looks for. Um, He's got size. He's got athleticism. He's competitive. But I think there are some concerns. Um, I think he was able to compensate for some of those deficiencies with his size and his length, and then you have to wonder if he'll be able to do that in the NFL. 
Um, he's another guy that was really competitive as a press man corner. I thought he was effective as a zone corner. You know, I wonder if you look at him and think of a cover three type corner, or, you know, and I know a lot of teams play more man now, but obviously there's a lot more single high coverage in the NFL now. So part of that is cover three, the zone portion of single high. And I, I thought watching him, maybe even though he does have press man traits, I thought maybe he'd fit best in kind of as kind of a cover three corner. Not, I'm not suggesting he's Richard Sherman, but he kind of made me think in that regard. That's the exact answer that I was looking for from you there, Greg. Uh, transitioning I, 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 to, I passed the test. You passed the test. Yes, flying colors as always. Come on now. All right. You never, you never sell yourself short whatsoever, Greg. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Making the transition here to uh, the last position group, the safeties. Uh, so much has been made. I feel like Greg in the media about Grant Delpit and his struggles as a tackler to the point where Fran made this great point on, on a recent episode of the podcast where he's becoming underrated in, in this draft process because he was so highly touted, was expected to be yep. you know, clearly the top safety. And obviously that's not the case right now. So what, what about his positive traits? What about the, the his, his aspect of his game as a covered safety? How is that going to transition to the NFL? Because that is still something that's extremely valuable and is going to make him a very high pick. I kind of lost everything you said there after you said Fran made a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Few and far between, Greg. We know that. <laughs> um, I really like Delpit. I mean, look, I made a point. My weakness is that he, at times he had a tendency to throw his body into people as opposed to squaring up and coming to balance. I think that's obvious. I don't think you have to be you know, a brilliant evaluator personnel to see that uh, he took some poor angles at times playing downhill in the run game there's no question that at times there were some concerns but this kid's over 6'2 he's really long he's kind of got a stalking feel to his movement he easily covers ground he played a ton of post safety and you know guys like him they're not necessarily sudden and explosive when you watch them but they cover a lot of ground I think he can play post. I think he can play in the box. Um, I really like him. I mean, he's a smooth athletic safety prospect who can play multiple positions. He played a ton of man coverage versus tight ends. He can absolutely do that. Uh, I like Delpit. I mean, yes, I know what the issues are, but I really think they can be cleaned up, and I like the player a lot. Greg, you talked about versatility. It it seems like that Xavier McKinney from Alabama, his skill set, as a multidimensional player, is more valued in today's NFL because of the quote-unquote search for positionless players. When you look at McKinney's game, is there one aspect that you can hang your hat on that you could say, all right, he's going to, at the very least, baseline be doing this as a rookie on Sundays this fall, assuming the season gets started on time? I think he'll play multiple spots. You know, he kind of reminded me of, he kind of reminded me of Chauncey Gardner-Johnson and kind of how he was used with the Saints. And I actually had a really good talk with their D.C. Dennis Allen at the Combine about that kind of player and, and how they're so effective for your defense, particularly sub-defenses, because a team like New Orleans played sub-80% of their snaps. So, you know, more and more teams are doing that, and it's those kinds of players that are becoming really, really important. Um, and I think McKinney fits that. He can even line up over the slot. But let me just make one point, and I don't know how you guys feel. I, I personally think that Isaiah Simmons is a safety in a base defense. I think his size says linebacker, and his style of play says safety. And, you know, to me, like if he was, if he was a – if he played safety in, in, in a cover four base scheme, like a Mike Zimmer scheme, I think that's, that's what he is. I don't think Simmons is a true linebacker in the way he plays. His size says he's a linebacker, but his style of play does not say linebacker. Yeah, I think that's fair, Greg. And uh, great points on Xavier McKinney, who I see as kind of like a, a Malcolm Jenkins style of player for you. There you, you go. Know, a lot There's of, another kind lot of, of guy, different yeah. roles. But yep. Isaiah Simmons, one of the more polarizing players in this draft and obviously looks the part, has made plays all over the defense, every level, every aspect of defense. So many people think he's a Derwin James, Cam Chancellor, potentially a Sean Taylor level of athlete. 
I didn't see that type of play personality out there. He's not this enforcer or this thumper. He's a really intriguing athlete. So what does that do for you on Sundays? Where are you going to use him? And I completely agree. He is a safety through and through on my board and in my opinion. Well, you know, he's the kind of guy that you want to get away from the body. He's not aligned him where the bodies are. He's a finesse player. He's not a thumper. He's not a powerful or strong player. Um, he, you mentioned Erwin James. I could see that for sure. I think when you get right down to it, he's a bigger Tyran Matthew. He's just a bigger athlete than Tyran Matthew, but that's what he is. Uh, and I think his value is in sub defenses because he does impact all three levels of your defense in a sub defense, but he's not to me a stacked linebacker in a base defense. Uh, so we'll see, obviously with the uh, impact of sub defenses and the usage of sub defenses, he'll be a factor. But he is kind of a freakish athlete. I mean, he's, you know, he just is. So, I mean, I keep thinking about that interception he made against Justin Fields in the semifinal oh, game. And, right. You know, he was retreating as a safety and then, you know, showed the range to get to the sideline. That, to me, is what he is. Absolutely. He does some things that, you know, you really can't coach, and he has some God-given athletic traits, obviously. I think making sure you give him a designated skill set and a role on a defense and not getting too excited with having him do too many roles and hats, in my opinion, will really help him out. But looking at a day two option of a, for lack of better words, another type of Isaiah Simmons is Jeremy Chin out of Southern Illinois. Much smaller player, actually showed up at 208 in the summer and then 221 at the combine. So he's been putting on weight, but it didn't hurt his 40 or his explosiveness. 4.45 and a 41 inch vertical similar player to Isaiah Simmons and that yes. he could do a lot of things for your defense but you can't get too excited in having him do everything so where do you think Jeremy Chin fits into uh, NFL defenses well I mean to me he's a safety in your base I mean they played I didn't watch his tape from prior to this year so I don't know what he did prior to this year at, at SIU because I know he's a four-year player um, I I, I from what I understand, he did play some games at corner, but he predominantly was a cover four safety. They played a ton of quarters. He was a half field cover four safety. Um, I thought he was good as a, an alley run defender. I thought he, he was very good in pass coverage. He showed the range to get from the hash to the sideline. Um, he was a very good blitzer. There was an explosiveness to his movement. He played fast. I think there was a competitive and physical element to his play. I, I sensed watching his tape that there was a savvy to his play as well. So I liked his tape. I think he's a fascinating prospect given the fact that he's 6'3", and whether he ends up being 221 or 215, he's still a big mm -hmm. safety. Absolutely, and he's obviously going to contribute on special teams. And one of the main issues with him, I think people haven't realized, the injuries. Missed three games in 2016, yeah. two games in 18, two games in 2019. When you start breaking it down, availability is a big ability as well. So these guys with the injury backgrounds, especially in this climate of medicals and not having the pro days, I just wonder where that factors into some teams' boards and decision-making. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, you know, it comes back to the whole Bill Parcells thing. Ability, you know, availability is is the key part here. You got to be able to play. Well, Greg, this has been outstanding. Really, really great stuff. Once again, thank you so much for joining us here on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the draft mailbag. Well, outstanding stuff from Greg Kozel. Guys, those are two of my favorite podcast discussions that we can have every single year. We have Greg at the end of this process. He's kind of all the haze in the barn. He's watched as many of these players as possible, and we can get his opinions on some of these prospects and how they translate to the NFL. All right, for draft mailbag this week, a little bit different. We're going to go with some prop bets. And C-Mac, I know you've cultivated some of these. Uh, excited to hear what you've got for us here to kind of wrap things up. Our last show before the 2020 NFL draft. Don't make me sad. I mean, don't make me sad. Uh, that's yeah. I was thinking, like, we gotta have a little fun here, okay? I think we've answered. You know, we've gone through everyone's mock drafts. We've answered a tons and tons of questions. I, I'm sure at some point, Fran, you'll want to know. Uh, you'll probably look up how many questions we've answered in draft mailbags over this entire process. I'm, I'm talking about going back to when you know the buildup for the 2019 season college football campaign kicked off. So. Uh, lots of great stuff, and we're so thankful that all of you have stayed along for this entire ride. So I figured let's have a little fun here. We'll do some some mock uh, draft prop bets, so to speak, here. 
to go through here. I've got about 10 or 11, so uh, we'll start things off here. Yes, it's simple yes or no to this one. We'll have a little fun here. Will Commissioner Roger Goodell somehow get booed during night one, Thursday night, of the 2020 NFL Draft? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it'll be tough. It'll be interesting. I know that they're going to do you know, like a fan, like, a, you know, like a, a group call and stuff like that. I would be shocked if that happened. That's an actual prop bet? Yes. Who's going to boo him? It could be piped in. It could be there, there's a pipe, virtual montage if they pipe of in, If they pipe in booing to Roger Goodell, that would be something. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's, part of the, it's part of the tradition at this point. If, so. I were, if I were Roger, I would have his kids or something there booing him and just make they, fun of the whole that thing. Would, there you man, go. That would be so amazing. That would be amazing. That would be great. That's, that's what I'm saying. So that's, that's, I don't know if he's a big self-deprecating no. guy, though, so we'll see. All right. How's your next one here? Which position group? But not position group, which side of the ball will have more players selected in day one, the offense or the defense? I'm going to say the offense. I feel like between the quarterbacks, the offensive tackles, the wide receivers, uh, you know, I feel like between those position groups, there's, there's, I mean, what, we're talking like 15, 16 guys right there alone. I'm going to go offense. Yeah, we'll go offense. I think the tackles, the quarterbacks always get bumped up, the deep receivers. There might even be a uh, you know running back or two squeezing in there. So put me down for offense. All right, we'll go through some of the, uh, let's see, position groups here. Over, under, Ben, we'll start with you. Over, under on quarterbacks in round one, setting it at three and a half. Uh, we got to go over there. I think we'll probably have four, if not five, maybe even a surprise six like we do every year, and these quarterbacks get bumped up. So I'm usually always taking the over on the quarterback lines. Okay. Well, that's, yeah. that's bold to go five or six, I was going to say. Yeah. You know, our Jordan Love didn't, didn't get selected in our, uh, you know, mock draft extravaganza, so that, that wouldn't even get you to four. So, Fran, he your take. He, he wasn't in Peter King's mock draft earlier this week. Uh, he's been, you know, quote, unquote, falling in a lot of mock drafts. Uh, I'm, I'm still going to take the over, though. And honestly, I'm going to stay on this hill, guys. I just wonder how far the, – the Tua Tonga Bailoa situation is going to be very, very interesting to follow throughout this. But I'm still going to take the over four quarterbacks. All right, let's, let's stick with Tua here. Got a prop at here. Over, under on his draft spot in the first round, setting it at ten and a half. Fran, you're up. Ooh, ten and I, a half. Uh, is he going to be a top ten pick? Bottom yeah, line, is, gonna, is Tua going to be a top ten pick at the I'm end of the day? Here. I'm going to go bold and say no. I don't, know, I don't know over. what little Fran's got you on over there, Fran. I think he's easily he's going to be a top 10 pick. And if somebody sees him sitting there at 8, 9, or 10, we could see an aggressive play to go get him if somebody really covets him and feels good about the medicals and X, Y, and Z. But, but how I'd be shocked. About the medicals? That's well, the that's the, that's I think, the, that's I think the it's like kind of the eye of the beholder. It seems like everybody has their own kind of opinion and perspective on the medicals and the future and, you know, how much you're needing somebody to play right away. Uh, for you obviously every situation is going to be different but I would just be shocked if a prospect and a potential you know of Tua Tonga Vailoa drops out of the top 10 even with the injury concerns all right so speaking of protecting Tua let's go over under on the offensive tackles selected in the first round of this year's draft we're setting it Fran at five and a half you're up here oh that's a good line five and a half five and a half I'm gonna I'm going to take the over, man. I just feel with, you know, teams are searching for offensive tackles. They want those guys, uh, you know, to come in and obviously protect against these pass rushers that we're talking about. You know, we talked about earlier today with Craig. To me, I, I just look at, at being the over. I think you have those studs at the top. You figure Josh Jones goes a little bit higher than people think. You figure, you know, obviously Austin Jackson as well. I'm going to take the over. Okay. Yeah, I lead towards the over too, and I think I could – run off five to be locks, and then it's just the, does Austin Jackson get in? Does Ezra Cleveland get in? I've seen Isaiah Wilson, right tackle out of Georgia, That's squeeze in. Yep, exactly. We could be looking at seven, maybe eight offensive tackles in the first round. I think a lot of those guys are more day one ready to play than some of those day two developmental guys that I don't know if they'll be day one plug-and-play starters like, you know, the Matt Pertz and Shadiq Charles of the world. But I think what all the buzz seems to be trending towards – more tackles towards the uh, back end of round one, and more skill players falling into day two. 
All right, it's a good thing I'm not a bookie. I would have lost money on that one because I feel pretty good with you guys that that will be an over as well. So, uh, Ben, one, one up your alley here. The amount of dogs that will appear in the first round in terms of whether it's GM, Ooh. head coaches, or even the virtual fan montages, I'm going to set it at two and a half here. And uh, this became a, became a big thing because the new Giants head coach, Joe Judge, there's actually a picture of him on Twitter with his dog resting on his lap as he's doing his work. And, and a bunch of the reporters, I think it was Ralph Bacchiano uh, up in New York, longtime uh, reporter, columnist up there, was saying that if only that dog could speak, the things that we, we could find out about the, the Giants draft plan. So uh, dogs appearing on the, uh, the broadcast. Right, night dogs night. appearing on the broadcast. That's individual dogs, correct? Individual dogs, yes. All right. As I sit here staring into the eyes of Sabrina, our Swiss Mountain dog, we got to play the over. And I think we're going to knock that out in one shot because I know somebody's got a pack of four or five dogs running oh, around just ready geez. to tear up the broadcast that, you know, they have a pack of golden <laughs> retrievers or something. So I think we're going to get the over on one shot. I'm not sure who it is, but whoever it is, I'll eventually be a fan of if, uh, from, from there on moving forward. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we're going to take the over here, too. I don't know if we're going to see a pack like, uh, you know, Christmas Story run in, steal the turkey and run out, but I feel like uh, one, of the, one of these guys is going to at least have a couple in the first round. I really And let's really face it, if you have a family dog and you're not putting them in your live shot, like, what are you even doing? I mean, this is the time to profile <laughs> the best things that you have. If you don't have a dog or a baby to work into the shot, you know, you really need to reconsider your choices. This is where you curry some favor with the fans, too. You know, it's like – all right, we know that this pick might not go over too well with the fans. It's not what they were expecting. But here's the family dog. You can't, you can't dislike us now. So uh, I, I never thought you'd ask me a question up my alley, C-Mac. I study these kids <laughs> all year long. But we finally got uh, how many dogs will we see on the draft broadcast question. See? I've been waiting all year for that. You're gonna, you see, the thing is you, you're helping with the broadcast. You're going to find a way to be like, hold on, I got something on this. We need to get this shot in there right now. So. Uh, let's see here. As we go down my list, a couple more here. Um, so ESPN's Adam Schefter reported that there were some technical difficulties right off the jump with the mock draft that was conducted around the league to make sure every team is good to go for Thursday. How Do you think the simple yes or no, I'll start with you here, Fran, will there be any video difficulties when bringing up either a GM head coach or a prospect? Will we get some buffering, some lag time? Uh, will, will we have to be doing some quick cutting on the fly? I got to think that somebody's kid is going to be playing like Madden upstairs and like the Wi-Fi is going to get affected and like, uh, you know, we're going to be yelling, get off the internet. You know, I'm trying to do a hit. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that it, we're going to get something. Uh, that might be earlier, you know, sooner rather than later. Okay, Ben? I don't know. This new age of GMs, so you have Andrew Barry and Gutekunst and Nick Casario. They're young. They're savvy. We don't have those old timers anymore that – are going to be farting around with their flip phones and calling in their kids to come help them, you know, connect to the dial up and stuff. I think we have too many young savvy GMs. There might be one or two out there, um, you know, that have some clunky moments there just because of technology, but uh, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. All right. uh, A couple more position ones here. Uh, Ben, we'll start with you on the wide receivers going over under four and a half selected on Thursday nights. Uh, We'll go over. Uh, I think it'll be right at five. I don't think it's going to be anything more than that. I think a lot of those are going to get slid to day two with the bump ups of the quarterbacks and the tackles and the kind of stingy interior defensive line class. We could see some guys like Ross Blacklock or Neville Gallimore maybe squeeze into the back end of round one just because there aren't a lot of options later on in the draft. So put me down for five. I think we hit the over, but just barely. Okay, Fran? Yeah, I feel like you've got the four locks, right, in, in Judy, Lamb, Ruggs, Jefferson. All we need is one more to break it. Yeah, I'm going to take the over. Okay. Uh, we'll go to the defensive side of the ball with the cornerbacks. How about five and a half for the over-under? Fran, you're up. That's a, to me, that's an easy, easy under. Uh, I think you have the two definites, obviously, in Henderson and in, uh, in Jeff Rakuda. After that, who's a who's a lock for the first round, right? I mean, I'd say I, I you talk about Christian Fulton, Jeff Gladney, Trayvon Diggs. Like I, I like a lot of those guys, but uh, to say like, oh yeah, like Jalen Johnson's definitely a first round pick. I, I'm gonna take the under there. Fran, okay. life's too short to play the under. You know that. 
always play the over, except in this scenario. <laughs> but, yeah, I guess I got to agree with you here. Put me down for Akuda and C.J. Henderson, and that might be it, really. I think Trayvon Diggs probably slides. I'm not sure who else would be in that conversation there. And obviously some more intriguing safety options with Chin and Isaiah Simmons and maybe Xavier McKinney working in there. I just can't see a, a picture with more than kind of three corners going in the draft. But uh, put me down for C.J. Henderson and, and Jeff Okuda at the top. All right, my last one here, a simple yes or no. Ben, we'll start with you off with this one. Will the top three – Go Burrow, Chase Young, Jeff Okuda, as everyone has been mocking for the last month or so. Oh, that's a really good question. I will say no. Um, I do not think Detroit will be there at three. I think someone's going to want to come up and take their quarterback. I'm also not willing to say Washington's going to sit there at two. Uh, like we've talked about this whole draft cycle, I think their strongest position is collectively across the defensive front with all those first-round picks and Montez Sweat and Kerrigan and the Alabama guys up front there, I just feel like readdressing a strong position as opposed to maybe trading out and getting a corner and a tackle and maybe a weapon for uh, Dwayne Haskins there. So I think they're going to be fielding offers and someone's going to want that second or third spot to go get a quarterback like we see every other year in the NFL draft. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no. I I think the first two are locked. I I would be I'd be really shocked if Washington moved off that spot. But I think Detroit. I'm gonna if I had to lean, I would say yeah. They're gonna they're gonna find somebody to be able to trade back and somebody that's gonna move up to steal Justin Herbert from the Miami Dolphins. Ooh, okay. So uh, Fran, you were a guest on the Birds with Friends podcast uh, with Bo Wall, Shil Kapadia, and Zach Berman. Uh, and you, you kind of teed up a question that you knew would be coming your way. Um, well, how many draft prospects did you end up uh, watching all said and done? Ooh. Uh, we still have a little time. Here. We have like 24 hours. Yeah, I get yes, it. we do. You, you uh, can probably get like 10 more guys in there, but you got to push us about how many draft prospects – did you get – actually, the question is supposed to be, is it the, is it the record? I think that's – Yeah, I don't think it's, – it's not going to be the record for sure. Uh, 327 is the number now. I know I have a couple guys that I definitely am going to get to before uh, the first round kicks off, so we'll say an even 330. Look at that. No, but Look C-Mac, that. that's always a backside reflection because I always want to know where's the first pick of somebody that Fran didn't watch or you haven't heard of. So it's usually a kind of a post-mortem type of thing on reflecting after the draft and finding that guy who is the earliest draft pick that Fran didn't watch. It's usually somewhere like early round five, late round four, like somewhere in that range. That'll be a fun uh, question. We'll make sure to bring that up uh, when we put everything to bed uh, Sunday and Monday. Well, guys, this was, uh, this was a lot of fun. Like I said, the last one before uh, the 2020 NFL draft kicks off uh, as my infant son jumps up onto my shoulders. He's excited. I'm excited. It's Christmas Eve. We're all excited uh, for the 2020 NFL draft to kick off. I'll be broadcasting from down here in my basement. Uh, and we're going to have Eagles Draft Central Thursday night. Uh, make sure you're tuned in. Myself, Amy Campbell, Ross Tucker, Dave Spinero. We're going to be breaking it all down, giving you inside access, interviews, analysis. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you're tuned in there on PhiladelphiaEagles.com, the Eagles mobile app, or any of the Eagles social media channels. We'll be dropping podcasts here as well every single night. Make sure you're tuned in for that. And we'll have recaps next week. So excited to get back together with you guys. Uh, well, that'll be it, though, for this week on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA.